Now, how many of you watched the NBA All-Star Game this, not this weekend, but last weekend? Uh, if you're a fan, can you raise your hand? You're an NBA fan? Okay, so in 2003, there was this guy, his name is LeBron James. You know, he was drafted number one overall, and uh, he was supposed to be like the next Michael Jordan. And uh, so, you know, there was a lot of hype. And then so two years afterwards, in 2005, uh, the Nike, which is the sponsor for LeBron James, started this uh, campaign. Uh, here, let me turn this on. Okay. Uh, with this picture. We are all witnesses, right? And, and I love this picture. And, and here's a line from Nike, and I'll, I'll quote it so I won't, you know, misspoke it. Uh, this is uh, the reason why they have this. The witness campaign pays tribute to James, or LeBron James, and acknowledges the legions of fans worldwide who are witnessing his greatness, power, athleticism, beautiful style of play. The campaign was first introduced in 2005, uh, November, with the unveiling of a 110 foot high by 212 foot wide billboard located adjacent to the Quicken Loans Arena in Cleveland. And, and I love this, 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 this poster is supposed to pay tribute and acknowledge uh, the fans who are witnessing his greatness, power, athleticism, and beautiful style of play. And as today we're reading the scripture, uh, you know, from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. There's this scripture, it says, that, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We're here as Christians because we are first-line witnesses to Christ's power in all of us. Now, what does that mean to all of us? Is this, is that, that here is the first thing that we want to talk about this morning. Is that, uh, actually, the, here, let me, this is the wrong the first thing is the command to witness, okay? Uh, so we have, a, sorry, I, I'm just not very into it right now. As you should pray for me right now, okay? So the first thing is this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And here's the call for all of us, that as believers, we are called to be witnesses for Jesus. There's no, you know, just you or the pastors or the deacons or the elders. If you are believers this morning, you have this call to be a witness for Christ Jesus. Now, now we cannot say, you know, like I have, you know, pastor for 10 years or so, and my dad's a pastor, so I grew up in church, and, and where I found that a lot of believers believe this witnessing for Jesus or proclaiming the gospel for Jesus is reserved for those who are called to service. So like, you know, deacons, elders, or leaders of the church, that we as regular lay people, we don't need to do this. But here's the scripture that Jesus said to us, that we will receive power when the Spirit comes, and that we will all be witnesses. And now we need to start from local, which is close to us, and then globally. We start with the own people group from, you know, being Chinese or Caucasian, whatever it is, your people group, and then you move on. And, and so this is the call for us. And, and the message is very simple. The message is Jesus. We're not to preach anything else. Uh, I had a conversation with one of my nephews when I went to uh, Taiwan this, uh, this trip uh, for, uh, for two weeks. And one of the questions I asked him was this, what do you think is the message of our faith? And he's like, well, you know, it's to love God and to love people. And I say, well, that's, that's good. That's the great commitment. Like, you know, like, like this is what we're supposed to do. Love God and love people. But I, I also notice this is that if you study like Buddhism or any other world religion, they also have some sort of clause like that. To love God and to love people. See, what separates our faith and our messages from all the religions in the world is this, is that our message is Jesus. We are to love people through the power of Jesus. We're to love God through the example of Jesus. See, we're not supposed to do it just like anyone else. We're supposed to do it through the power, the recognition, and the role model of Jesus Christ. See, that's what our message is about. See, you're, a lot of times I've, I notice that the church, when we share about the message of message of our faith, we talk about prosperity, we talk about peace, we talk about blessings of God, forgiveness of God, and oftentimes we leave out Jesus. We have all these wonderful things, but there is no Jesus in our message. So the command to witness is very simple, that we as believers, we're all called to be witnesses for Jesus. And the message is simple, we are to talk about Jesus, nothing more, nothing less. And the plan is this, is that we start locally and we work our way globally and we start with our own people group and then we work out to other people group and the second thing is this is that sorry i gotta go back the power to witness verse 8 but you will receive power when the holy spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in jerusalem and in all judea and samaria and to the ends of the earth 
And here's the simple thing. The promise is that all believers, when we're called to do this witnessing, we will receive this power from the Holy Spirit. And for the purpose of witnessing, see, God has promised that, hey, not only I have given you a command, a commission to proclaim my name, I will also give you the tool to do so, that you are able to do it because I will give you the Holy Spirit and you will have power to do so. And here are the stories that we read in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. In chapter 2, we know the Pentecost came and, and believers come together and they were worshiping and somehow the Spirit came upon them and they were able to speak different tongues and, and share the gospel to different people groups. And, and it was, it was kind of wild in a way. And I remember one time when I was a kid, someone shared with me that they went to a revival meeting. And during this revival meeting, they were able to see this vision of the Holy Spirit, okay? And the Holy Spirit was like this, this dove flying around the arena or something like that, and, 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 and just going around and it's touching people and everything. And I imagine that to be something sort of a, a real interesting scene to, to be a part of. And I always wonder if will I ever experience and witness something like that? You know, and here we see in the Pentecost, the Spirit came and people were changed. And soon after, Peter came up and he was, uh, he was speaking this, this great message to the people. And, and, you know, if you read that message, it, it's really a simple message. It's nothing fancy. It talks about history of Jesus and, you know, the, and things like that in the Old Testament, New Testament and things. And, and 3,000 people became believers. And as I was reading that, I say, well, you know, that's a, a very good story because I wish as a pastor, I can go out and preach a message where 3,000 people will come and just say, you know, we want to commit ourselves to Christ. And I hear stories about a lot more things about, you know, if we have the power of the Spirit, we can do great things. And, and, and here's one of my struggle, though. And this is really the highlight. And, and Pastor Dean mentioned that he... You know, he talked about the scripture, you know, uh, Acts 1, verse 8. Uh, you know, so, so we kind of have to see, like, what we're talking about. But I'm not really focusing on the power itself or, or you know, whatever this, this, you know, this mission to us is all about. But I'm really talking about this power outage that we have in our churches this morning. And I, here, this is really what I'm trying to talk about this morning. The reality of being a witness in today's setting. I don't know about you, but when I go to a church, especially a conservative church like ours, is I, I sometimes I feel like there's a, this, this power outage. Like, I go to a church service, right, and we sing, but we're not really into that singing. Like, we're singing, but we're not really singing, you know, like from our hearts. You know, we're worshiping, but we're not really worshiping. And I've been to churches where I go in, and I'm just amazed about, you know, like everything about them. I, I, I go in, and I can't stop but feel like the presence of the Spirit with me, and I can't help but feel like, you know, I'm touched by the Spirit. And, and, but sometimes I go to a church, even my own church I grew up in, is this is that we have so much tradition. And, and somehow I just feel like, is God really with us? Is, is the Spirit really with us? And, and, and I sense that we have a lot of people who come to church, but who are indifferent to their faith. You tell them to share the gospel. They, yeah, we are supposed to share the gospel. I remember one time I have a brother, a close brother of mine, and... Um, and I, I told him that, you know, you need to get more involved. You need to be more passionate about your faith. And he, and he answered me. He's like, well, I, I'm teaching Sunday school. I'm helping out church, and I do this, and I tithe. And, and it seems like there's this idea that as long as we, we do a few things at church, then, then we're okay as Christians. And, and there seems to be a lack of power in our church today. And, and, it's, and, and we look at Acts Church and the church is there, you know, believers were added day by day, and they were worshiping, they were talking about, you know, things of God and miracles and all that stuff. And I look at our churches and I say, what happened to us? It, it seems like there's, there's nothing going on. Like, there's no excitement, there's no power, there's no passion. And, and I remember there was a, a couple in my old church, and they were so frustrated with the church setting. They say, you know, like, I, I, we, we, we disciple people. You know, we teach people about, you know, following Jesus and, you know, living out, you know, this Christian faith. And, and, but no one's listening. Everyone's very happy with their 9 to 5 job, living in their big house, driving their nice cars. And, and it's just like we don't have that passion or this power to do anything. And, and, and we, we, we claim that, that the Spirit will change us. But we see no change in ourselves, in our churches. We're doing the same thing 
over and over again and, and we're losing people to the world, we're losing people to, to so many different things and, and somehow we're not adding people to the church, we're subtracting from the church. We, we have a decline in attendance, we have people who leave the faith all the time, we have the younger generation who goes to college and they'll never come back. It seems to me that my observation is this, is that in the reality of being a witness today is that there is a power outage in our church. In fact, this couple, they were so frustrated with the lack of passion and desire for the people to, to love God and to love the people, they started to pray and seek power to change others and themselves. And they went to the extreme. They opened themselves up for, for different types of spirit. And we had to deal with that aftermath. But sometimes I wonder, myself is this is that what kind of power do I possess as a believer we were promised that the Holy Spirit will come and give us power but somehow I feel even as a pastor sometimes I'm powerless you know I was reading our church uh, uh, what's it called the, the prayer list on Wednesday night and I read it and I say man there's so many things I feel so overwhelmed because I pray and nothing happened and I look at the list and I say man there are people who are sick there are people who are looking for jobs and I pray for them and, and just like you know when you were in a small church that list was like five ten max right but when you're at church, the setting, and when I look at that list, there were like 50 things to pray about. And week in, week out, when you see no result and you feel like, what is this power that was promised to us? I mean, on the Spirit, on, supposed to work and empower us to do great things, you know, to heal, to, to provide us with blessings and all that great things. But I don't see any of that. I, I feel like we don't have that. Maybe you feel that way too that we don't feel like we are empowered by the Spirit to do anything, let alone witnessing for Christ. I mean, if you don't have that power, how do you even share about Jesus? And I notice, I notice this is that sometimes we'll go on retreats, right? We'll go to a revival meeting and we'll, we'll be charged up for like a week or two. And then soon afterwards, you know, then we're out of power. And, and then we can't do anything and we feel frustrated about our faith we feel frustrated about ourselves you know the lack of passion towards God and and we have all these problems that we face that we can't solve and we pray and we pray and just there seems to be no answer but yet the promise was this is that we are to be witnesses and that we will have power and I asked this question to you this morning and to myself what happened what happened to the power that they had 2,000 years ago. Why don't we have it today? Why don't you have it? Why don't I have it? Why don't our churches have it today? That, where is the power? And I, I, I realized that there are a couple of things that happen. And first thing is this, is that, that you know, our reality, we seem to have a power outage today, that we have no power. This promised power of the Spirit, it's not in us. And I think the first problem is this, is that we have taken the Holy Spirit out of our faith. I grew up in a conservative church, in a very fundamental church, and, and, and and we are afraid to talk about the Spirit because we are afraid that people will label us as charismatic. We're saying that, hey, let's not talk about the Spirit because as soon as you mention that, people are thinking that you are charismatic. You're talking about speaking tongue, healing, and power evangelism and all that stuff. And you're like, no, no, I, I don't want to talk about that. We're afraid of having this label that people see us differently. And another reason why we don't talk about Holy Spirit is this, is that, that we live in a world of statistics and science and there seem to be no place for the supernatural or their spiritual realm. And we don't want to talk about it, especially in the Bay Area. You know, it's all about scientists and engineers. And, and when you talk about supernatural things or things beyond science, you know, people kind of look at you and say, you know, like, you know, that's for people who are uneducated. We're people of science. You know, we know evolution. We know all this good stuff. And we don't believe in the supernatural or divine power that you speak of. And we're afraid that people will make fun of us when we start to talk about our faith or, you know, the power of the Spirit, whatever it is. So we start to take out the Spirit in our churches, in our lives. And some of us, we don't even believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm one of them. Well, I was one of them. When I grew up in a church in a very conservative setting, we were told that Spirit does indwelling and changes in your life. And that's really true. But we, we shy away from talking about supernatural things. It wasn't until my first mission trip that I led to Mexico, or my second one that I led to Mexico, I was at an orphanage. And we had a great time, you know, serving the, you, the kids there and, and just enjoying fellowship and everything. And, and, and that night, you know, it was around Christmas time and, 
and we brought presents and, and you know, the hosts, were, they were really, you know, awesome people. And they said, you know what, we should really have a campfire, you know, and just to celebrate, to worship, to share testimonies about what God's done in our lives and, and you know, just be thankful. And, and I say, that's a good idea. But then I look out the window and it was, it was kind of dark and it's kind of cloudy because it was gray and the forecast, and I had an iPhone at that time and I look up the weather, you know, there's a forecast, rain's coming, right? And then this director of an orphanage, she told me this, it's like, hey, pastor, why don't we pray that God will clear the sky and then so that we can have a prayer meeting, I mean, sorry, we can have a bonfire and we can make testimonies and sharing and singing and all that stuff. And of course, as a pastor, I said, yes, because you're not supposed to say no. That's a spiritual thing, right? Even though it, deep inside of me, I knew that wasn't going to happen. Because I said, you know, here's the weather forecast. There are the clouds. It's going to rain, you know, no matter what you do, right? So I'm sitting there, you know, I have this dilemma, right? I got to pray, right? She's asked me to pray as a pastor, spiritual leader, whatever it is. I need to pray. And I say, okay, let's pray. So I pray the prayer. I say, God, you know, please take away the clouds. Let us have a good day. And then so good night, clear sky, so we can have this fire and no rain and whatever it is. And, and, and as I pray that prayer, I'm like, you know, I'm being skeptical about it. And she's praying the prayer, and she seems to be so passionate and so into it, right? I'm like, there goes the charismatic people, you know, like, you know, it's like, hey, whatever, right? So I'm praying, and she's praying. And, and as we pray, and I look up, and I, and, and, and I just see somehow the clouds were disappearing. And I'm like, no, 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 that, that can't happen, right? And I'm praying, and I'm seeing, and I, I, I say, wow, you know, like, the Spirit really works. I mean, this prayer thing, you know, it works, you know. It's not just in the biblical knowledge of how it works, but really, if you believe and if you trust, and somehow God can provide supernatural things, and I'm telling you that that's probably like the only time in my life something like that happened. It hasn't happened since then, but my faith is, is the same. You know, I still believe in the power of the Spirit, but sometimes God uses sp supernatural things to remind us that He is a supernatural God, that He's beyond this understanding understanding that we have, but sometimes we have taken out the Spirit because we don't believe in the power of the Spirit. And sometimes we take the Spirit out of our faith because we make our faith into the exact science. Sometimes people ask me, how do you share the gospel? And maybe I'll ask you this question this morning, how do you share the gospel? And some people will tell you, I use the fourth spiritual law. And some people will tell you, I use EE, evangelism explosion. And, I, and you have different methods and different things. And I notice that, that, that somehow, somewhere along the way, we have this exact science of how to share a gospel, how to run a church, how to live a life as a Christian. And we have this rule book that you follow. If you talk about this, and then you lead into this, and then that, and then this, then this will be the conclusion or this will be the result. At churches, we do that all the time. We somehow have this perfected art of building churches, planting churches, sharing the gospel, and how to do conversion, how to do discipleship. And somehow, we don't need the Spirit to help us anymore because we have all the books we need. We talk about DIY stuff, like self-help books and all that stuff. You know, the church is somehow becoming this place where we have rule books for everything that we do. We have how to do worship. We have how to preach. We have all these wonderful things that are tools that becomes the end of what we do. Sometimes I don't like using PowerPoints because I feel like PowerPoints restrict me from what I want to say. I need to follow the PowerPoint. I need to follow everything. And, and here's the problem. It, when we do that, it's not a bad thing to have PowerPoint because it does help you to have points and all that stuff. But for me, it restricts me from really being able to allow the Spirit to speak through me. I want to speak because the Spirit moves me to speak. I don't want to speak because I want to speak. Do you understand what I'm getting at? That sometimes we as a church, we add so many things to our faith that our faith no longer needs Jesus. We no longer need Christ. We no longer need the Spirit. We just need Pastor Dean or Pastor Jim or whoever it is and the leaders in our churches. That's all we need. We need a good book. We need whatever it is. But we don't need Jesus. We don't need the Spirit. We have taken out the Holy Spirit out of our faith because we have this exact science of how to do everything in our churches today. Now, personally, I think the best way to witness is a good old-fashioned way of telling people about your story, what Christ has done, what the Spirit has done in your life. I think that's the best way because no one can refute that. That is yours and yours alone. That is the work of the Spirit. And no one else can say, well, I challenge that because they're not you. 
In fact, if you see in John chapter 4, there was a woman by the well, a Samaritan woman. And that's that when Jesus came to encounter with her, all she did, did was tell people about Jesus and what he was spoken about her. And that brought masses of people to, to Jesus. See, we don't need to overcomplicate a lot of things in our faith. We simply need to have the Spirit and Jesus in our lives again. And the best way to witness for Christ is to tell people about Christ in your life. To tell people about the Spirit that is working in you, that is changing you. And sometimes, here's the second thing, why we have a power outage in our churches this day. It's just that we have this wrong view of the Holy Spirit's power. See, when we talk about power, we often think of this overwhelming supernatural power that allows us to command the winds, like the story that I shared, you know, somehow the cloud will disappear, or somehow we were able to heal people, you know, raise people from the dead, the lame will walk, and the sick will be healed, and, and everyone will be good, and prosperity is abundant to all of us. And in fact, there's a, a so-called Christian sect faith, or a sect of a Christian faith where we have pastors who routinely place themselves in danger by allowing snakes to bite into them. And they call themselves sign-following churches. And they base their, their practice on the scripture in Matthew 16, 17 to 18. It says this, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. Uh, sorry, notes. I do need notes. Uh, they will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on a sick people and they will get well. And we have a group of people, a group of Christians today, even existed today, that they will purposely place themselves in danger, okay? Have snakes bite them, okay? Just to show that the Spirit is with them, that they have this power. And, and we have this idea that somehow we need miracles. We need to be able to perform supernatural things to really show that the power of the Spirit is within us. And when we do that, when we have this wrong focus about the power, we overlook the miracles that is supernatural every day. See, you see, the fact that you and I are living today, that is a miracle. I have this uh, friend, uh, you know, we met a few times in London, and, uh, and, and she's a visiting scholar to uh, one of the schools in London, and, and she's a medical doctor, and she's a gynecologist. And, and she shared with me, and shared with the group actually, uh, about how, you know, we, we think conceiving a baby is easy, right? We think having a baby is easy, you know, babies happen all the time. But she, as a person of, you know, medicine and, and doctor and a scholar, she said that in order for that to happen, you know, it, it's, it's really, it, it takes a miracle to conceive a baby. And then, you know, the, they have to have the right time, you know, the sperm and everything. I don't, don't want to go into detail for you guys. Some of you are too young to understand this. But, but it takes a very exact science for childbirth to happen, or, I mean, you know, inception to happen. And, and it takes an exact science for everything to go right. Do you know that a lot of people will have miscarriages because that is the body's way to reject a, a abnormal baby? Do you know that not every day someone can... Ha I have friends who, who try to conceive babies that they can't. And there are people who will like, you know, right away they have babies. We don't understand how that happens, but it's a miracle of life. I, there's this guy, his name is Francis Collins. He is the director of National Institute of Health. And he was the former lead scientist of the Human Genome Project. And this is one of the things that he mentions. He is a person of faith. He's a Christian and he's a, you know, a great scientist. And, and this is a quote that he gave us. He says that at the most fundamental level, it is a miracle that there is a universe at all. It's also a miracle that it has an order, fine-tuning, that allow possibility of complexity and laws that follow precise mathematical formulas. Contemplating this, an open-minded observer is almost forced to conclude that there must be a mind behind all this. To me, this qualifies as a miracle, a profound truth that lies outside of scientific explanation. In short, what he's saying is this, is that, that when he studied the human DNA, when he studied the science, the realm of science, he has one conclusion, that it's a miracle that we're even here. That, that in order for us to be breathing, walking human beings, so many things have to go right. And yet, we don't see that as a miracle. We, we want something bigger. We want something grand. We want something that we can show off to the world because we feel like that is the only way that the Spirit works. But per perhaps we're forgetting the greatest miracle of the Holy Spirit is this, that the power to change you and I. The Spirit's power enables us to become the person we're not supposed to become and takes us, takes us away from the person that we're supposed to become. 
Now we have this going joke between my wife and I is this I used to be I was a salesperson and and I can sell anything basically you know I sell used cars and you know I can sell you know rebuilds and whatever it is you know and so so you know we we dress things up and and I try not to as a Christian I want to make sure that I'm good to my ethics my morals and my my religious views but here's the funny thing is this that I notice that sometimes if I really want to I can be very convincing to tell people all the lies, all the things that they want to hear, just to make a sale. And I notice one thing about myself is this, that if I'm not of faith, if I'm not in faith, then I could be in the front page of a newspaper, not because I'm a good guy, but because I might defraud the people, and I might make the news because I'm a criminal, or whatever it is. And, and, and my wife, we have this understanding that, that without faith, I will be a great sinner. I will be a great criminal, basically, is what I'm trying to say. But here's the thing though, I'm standing here this morning as a pastor, as a person who, who sometimes I surprise myself because, you know, I, I, I hear stories like this all the time. But, but, you know, it used to be that when I go to a grocery store and, and they give you extra change, what do you do? You keep them, right? Right? No, no, you don't? Okay, maybe that's just me. But I used to have all these, you know, like sometimes to me mistakes, right? And I'm looking at that mistake and I'm like, Thank you, Jesus, and I'll put it in my pocket, right? And, and, and then as I progress in my faith, I notice something. Is this is that, that when that happened again, instead of trying to pocket it and thanking Jesus for someone else's mistake, I went back and I returned it. See, that's against my regular instinct. Because my instinct is for me. And thank you, Jesus, for the blessing. Less for you, more for me. But somehow, as a Christian, as I progress in my faith, as the Spirit works in me, I'm changing to become a person that's not supposed to be. And I start to care about people I'm not supposed to care. You know, the people who crossed you, like the people who hurt you, the people who betray you, you're not supposed to care about them. But somehow, there's this voice, this, this power inside of you that prompts you to do things that you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to care for the people who are homeless. You're not supposed to care for the people who are just, you know, strangers on the street. But every time, every now and then, I'll have this prompting from the Spirit just to go and, and share the gospel or just share a meal or share a hand, just a helping hand with those who are in need. And that's not my instinct. I'm not better than that. You know, I'm, I'm just like a lot of bad people who see them and, and ignore them or don't care about them or make up a reason that why they should suffer and whatever it is, bad choices that they made. But, you know, when I allow myself to listen to the Spirit, to listen to the prompting, to the changes inside of me. Allow the Spirit to work in that. That's the miracle. See, that's one of the greatest miracles because, you know, there's so many different sayings in so many different cultures that it's easier to do so many different things, but to change a person, that's impossible. And sometimes we forget that's the, the biblical story of the power of the Spirit. Peter was a fisherman. He wasn't supposed to stood in front of 3,000 people or 4,000 people, or whatever it is, amount of people, and share the gospel, and being so eloquent and know the histories and all that stuff. He was a fisherman. Somehow he was able to. He wasn't supposed to eat with the Gentiles, but when the Spirit prompted him, give him dreams and show him that this is the will of God, he submitted and he surrendered himself. And he did things to, to make bridges with the Gentiles and bring more people to Christ than ever. And, and I, I can't help but wonder what happened to us. Perhaps we have the wrong view of the Spirit this morning as well. We seek power. We seek this, this ability to show other people that we're better than them. But sometimes the Spirit has this changing power to show that we are not as good as other people, but somehow God has placed this favor on us that changes us, allow us to be a better person. And you see, that's the best witness you can do. See, you can tell people about the flaws that you have and how Jesus has changed you to become a better person. When I talk to a lot of people, and I share this, and I say, you know, I'm actually naturally, I'm an introvert. I don't like to go out. I want to stay at home. And, and, and even today, you know, if I have the choice, I would not want to talk to any strangers. You know, you go on your way, I'll go on my way. I'm going to go home, read a book, go on the internet, surf, play games, whatever it is. I don't like to interact with people. In fact, I hate public speaking. My, my college year, I had to do that and, and do my high school years. I've hated that throughout my entire life. But this is what I do, right? In fact, this church is actually better. I do seven times with the Chinese and 12 times with the English. But my old church, you know, we have 
50, how many, how many weeks? 52 weeks a year? And I probably have to do like 45 weeks, you know, or even 48 weeks, whatever it is. I preach almost every Sunday. I have to get up in the morning and just, you know, get ready. And you have no idea what a dreadful event that is for me every Sunday. Waking up early because I'm afraid I'm going to mess up and I have to practice and I'm looking in the mirror sometimes. I'm like, okay, you got this, you got this, you know, just get myself ready, you know, pumped up and just to, to be ready for church, right? And, you know, this scares me the most in this church is I have to do this twice, you know? My old church, once and done. I don't have to think about it, right? But here's the problem with two services. I have this, like, 30 minutes to think about what went wrong and not just kind of like, oh, you know, like, what do I do, God? And, and, and here's the thing. I don't like this. I don't like it at all. But every Sunday, I'm also feel like, I also feel like I'm blessed to do this because I get to partner with the Holy Spirit to speak. I get to do things that I can't even imagine that I'm able to do. And I get to witness firsthand the power of the Spirit every time I preach because it's not by me that I'm doing this. In fact, you will notice that sometimes as a pastor, uh, you know, we would think we did a great message, right? And then people be like, eh, you know, it's okay, right? And we're like, we really bombed that one, okay? We're like, oh, disappointed, dis you know, depressed and everything about it. And someone will come up to you and the pastor, your message really spoke to me. And that's when I came to the realization, it's not about me. It's about the Spirit. It's about Jesus. It's about the Word. See, do we believe in that? Do we... <laughs> Are we willing to invite the Spirit back to our church, back to our messages, back to our small groups, back to everything that we do? Or are we going on by our way? In fact, I see this in churches all the time. We use our own understanding to manage, to lead, to do a lot of things. And I guess the conclusion is very simple. Our solution to having this, the Spirit feel power in our lives is to return back to a simpler time to trust in the Holy Spirit, to let the Spirit work in all of us, to let Him lead. I had this conversation with my uh, sister-in-law, my brother-in-law this time, and um, you know, they're, they're, they, they're non-believers, and um, so they were asking me last year around this time, I was contemplating to leave my, my church, and uh, the church I've been with 10 years, and um, it was a hard decision. We're discerning and praying and things like that, and um, so, you know, this year when I went back, they're like, oh, you're at a new church, you know, and all that stuff, updates and things like that. And, and they say, well, how did you come to that decision to go to this church? And I say, I pray and I fasted and I pray, you know, I just, I don't want to make the wrong decision. Uh, I see myself committing to a church community for as long as possible until God calls me away. So I don't take this decision lightly. And they ask me, how many choices did you have? And I say, well, you know, I have many choices, but eventually it came down to three choices. And, and they all want me to do this same thing, right? And, and the three churches have uh, a small church plant, a medium-sized church, around three, four hundred people, and in this church, a larger church. And they say, well, is that why you picked the church? Because it's a, a larger church. And I say, actually, that's exactly the reason I didn't want to come to, to Home of Christ number five, because I grew up in a large church. And, and, and the church is similar to this. And the last thing I wanted to do was go back to a church setting like that. Because I know that, that there can be a lot of politics, a lot of backstabbing, and you know, a lot of whatever it is. I don't want to go into details, but I don't like big churches. That's just me. And I prefer small churches. And, and they say, well, so then why, why, why did you come? Is it because they have the best pay? And I say, well, you know, it's really not that. You know, pay was not really on my equation. I mean, it was a struggle, you know, because you know, we need to make a living. But that wasn't the reason why I came here. And if I can share with you is this is that, that definitely I'm not coming here for the pay, okay? Uh, because pastors, uh, ask Pastor Dean, like he can work somewhere else and make more money. So coming to church and working for a church, pay is not the issue. So they ask me, why did you come? I say, you know what? I really didn't know. I just prayed and I fasted and I felt that the Spirit was prompting me to come to this church. I, I didn't know why. But I had to take a leap of faith, you know, to go to a place that I least wanted to go and, and just say, I got to trust because I pray, I fasted, and I believe in the guidance of the Spirit. And I came. And as soon as I came, I realized that this is the right place for me. It's not because, you know, 
I have whatever it is. But I realized that, that I, and I, I share this with you, is that there is a developing bromance between Pastor Dean and I. And uh, also, uh, I'm hoping to develop another bromance with another pastor, Pastor Chu, with the Chinese side. And there's a reason why, because I realized that I love this setting because we have like-minded people who cares about the gospel, who cares about the community, who wants to share the gospel to the community and disciple people and all that good things. And it's really hard to have three young pastors coming together to work along the same side and just say, hey, we want to build this place in the name of Jesus. We want the Spirit of God to work in all of us. We want to disciple, we want to see the church grow, we want to see people grow. And we don't have an agenda for ourselves, and we just want to come together. And I said, that's the reason why I see that why God was leading me here. And that was not the reason that I can see prior to coming here. And it takes trust in the Spirit to come here. And sometimes, I think that's something that we need to reflect on. Perhaps today, the Spirit is prompting you to do something. Perhaps He's asking you to do something that is out of ordinary, to get out of your comfort zone, to give sacrificially, to love your enemy, to share the gospel with the people that you feel like they will not listen. Will you trust in the Spirit that He will work with you and through you and give you that power to do the impossible? Because as you do that, you get to witness again the true power of Jesus, the true power of the Spirit, that you are able to just be amazed. Like I was when I prayed that prayer to send the clouds away so that we can have a testimony night with fire and everything. Do you trust that God can use you this morning, that God is changing all of us to do something bigger than all of us, to be witnesses for Jesus, to share that gospel, to share that